Welcome to Belly Dance Alchemy, a captivating blend of the best elements of career and professional development and the magic of belly dance. I'm your host, Kelly Nottingham. Ready to make your day job sparkle and your dance life grow in new and inspiring ways? Well, let's see what we can brew up. My first private coaching lesson with my dance teacher was absolutely terrifying. It was exciting but terrifying. And I was frankly, completely unprepared for what that session was going to be like. And the funny thing is, in my corporate work, I've seen the exact same thing from people I've mentored, private clients who hire me to coach them. It can be a terrifying, exciting time, but they are often unprepared for the sessions. So today's focus for the podcast is on getting the most out of your time during a private mentoring or coaching session. The next episode, we're going to be talking about being an effective mentor or coach and how that can build skill sets for you as well. Uh, If you have questions, please feel free to reach out to me at bellydancealchemypodcast at gmail.com or at alchemybellydance.com. So what we're going to be covering today is to know what you want to get out of your session, to take the initiative in being clear with goals and your desired outcomes, and then to do the work and report back on what it is that you're doing. Now, mentoring is a great way to build on your career skills. Getting lessons, private lessons or private dance coaching is a fantastic way to build dance skills. You can learn new things, you can find new direction, you can get some guidance on your next moves, be they corporate or in your hips. There's a bit of a difference in the non-dance and dance world. So in the business world, mentors are usually free. It's somebody normally that you find that wants to work with you, uh, somebody maybe that you look up to in a skill set. Coaching in the business world is very, very rarely free. And it's the same in the dance world. You are going to end up paying for coaching or private lessons. However, whether you're trying to find a mentor at your day job to help you improve your career, or you're paying a coach to help you with your professional or dance life, there's a lot of overlap in how you can make your time with your mentor or coach as effective as possible. So as we go through this episode, Just remember that the same best practices apply whether you found someone at your company to mentor you or you've hired a dance teacher to coach you. I'm going to use the word learner throughout this episode so I don't have to keep saying mentee coachy, which is honestly, if you say it more than like three times in a row, it just starts to sound really weird. So we're going to go with learner. The biggest issues that I see with both mentoring and dance coaching, one, Learners expect for it to work like magic, and somehow just having that session or that relationship with a mentor or a coach is somehow going to solve all of their problems and challenges. It's not designed to do that. The impetus is on you as the learner, not on your mentor or coach, to drive progress and to make the efforts to make the relationship work. Number two biggest issue that I see, learners not having clarity on what they actually want to accomplish. Clarity on your goal for mentoring or coaching drives the whole bus. So we have to get clear first before we do anything else. So let's talk about four common goals, either in mentoring or dance coaching. One, To learn more about a specific aspect of a job or of the dance. So music, cultures, styles of dance, costuming, educational background that you would need for a specific job and what the day-to-day job is like, for example. Number two is guidance on stepping up to a new level. So this could be a promotion. It could be moving into teaching dance. It could be going pro as a gigging dancer. Number three is to develop a new skill set. So this could be very specific down to like how to do public speaking, learning a specific choreography, how to build your zilling skills, how to work Zoom to do meetings online. Or number four, it can be to get feedback. This is often used either pre-performance or for a competition prep and dance, 
or for presentation skills or interviewing in a corporate setting. Now, this isn't an exhaustive list by any means, but I just wanted to give you some ideas of the types of learner goals that are very common because there are ways to work with your mentor or coach that maybe you haven't thought about before. So if you're thinking that a mentor or coach could help you, what exactly do you want to improve or learn? What would it mean to say the relationship has been successful when it's over? Do you have clear criteria for what success means? Your mentoring or coaching goal will define who would be best for you to work with, how long you need to work with them, how often you need to work with them. So this is the mistake that I made when I first came to my first private dance lesson was that I came with no agenda. Uh, I scheduled some time with my teacher and I thought I had a clear idea of what I wanted. But honestly, when I got into the session with her, I realized that I really did not have a clear agenda and a clear goal for what I wanted to accomplish. So you as the learner, bring the agenda to the session. Don't expect your mentor or coach to ask questions and dig into your background and create goals for you. You need to take the driver's seat. Usually you will have a general idea of what you want to talk about or what you want to work on. And again, that relates up to those goals, but you can also have questions ready for your mentor or coach. So I have some example questions that you can think about uh, asking your mentor or coach. What ideas do you have for a different way to approach this situation? When have you ever dealt with a similar challenge and what did you do? What would you recommend as the first step I should take? How do you make decisions around this topic? What is your approach for doing blank? What are the three most important things for me to know before I start? This is the problem or issue I'm seeing in myself. What have you done or seen that helps with this? So these are some great questions that you can use to get your private session or your mentoring sessions off to a good start and really start to get the conversation going. I also recommend that you bring suggestions for what you think might help your situation or your learning opportunity here. The mentor or your coach or your teacher might tell you, yeah, I don't know that I would actually do that or I have a different recommendation. But bringing suggestions shows that you've put in thought and you've put in time into the process. You as a learner should also plan on reporting your progress in each session, especially if you're going to be having follow-up sessions on a regular basis. What have you discovered since the last meeting? What have you done with the information that was shared by the mentor or coach? Sharing this will show the mentor you're actually implementing things, trying new things out, and that you're not just putting the burden of the relationship on them. So some other ways to work with a mentor or coach. Rehearsing a situation you're preparing for, such as a job interview, a presentation, a negotiation, or a delegation. Now, that's obviously, those are for corporate examples. For dance, uh, it might be approaching a possible place to gig and negotiating a price and actually practicing that conversation so that you don't feel thrown off guard when those questions start to come up with that potential client. Uh, It could be putting together a proposal to perform at a convention. What do you need to do to get ready for that? What do you need to do to get ready for a competition or for an upcoming show? Asking your mentor or coach on recommendations on books, podcasts, DVDs, or online courses that they have found useful. Introductions to people you need to know or perhaps dancers or musicians that you should follow on social media or people that you should study with or study their videos to learn more about their style. And one really big one is getting feedback on yourself and your personal brand, your professional brand in a corporate setting. How am I viewed by others? What are some of my blind spots that I don't see about myself and my skill set? Now, if you are open to asking for feedback, and this can be really, really tough to do um, because you're making yourself really vulnerable when you're asking for feedback, especially if you have a level of trust with your teacher or your mentor or your coach, 
that they may actually give you feedback that you don't want to hear. And that can be very difficult to listen to, and it can be very difficult to not get defensive about. So if you are asking for feedback, a huge piece of the equation is being willing to graciously accept the feedback as the gift that it is. Getting feedback is tough. It can feel really bad. It can feel rough and it can be terrifying to ask for and to get, but it will accelerate your skills like nobody's business. Now, I was very sensitive to feedback for a really long time. And honestly, you know, it it never really goes away. You can still have some sensitivity to it. Uh, But one thing that really helped me was to open up my understanding of it. And realizing that the mentor or coach isn't criticizing you. They're offering their perspective on how to get better. Yes, it's their opinion, but if you're focused on giving an audience a performance or giving a company the best work you can, it behooves you to get another person's perspective on how you're doing. I'm sure we've all had situations where we felt we were doing something super amazing only to find out later we had missed the mark by a mile. Feedback can help to fix this kind of situation. So as an example, I was in a professional development training certification course years ago. And as part of that certification course, we watched the facilitator actually train the content. And then we had to take little chunks of that content and turn around and present it to the group. And we got feedback from the facilitator and from our other people, our other peers in the group. And I was terrified. I was terrified. I thought of an example that I wanted to use in my presentation. And I thought it was a funny example. But the way I worded it didn't strike my colleagues in the same way that it struck me. It was a sarcastic sort of humor. They thought that it was too rough and too insensitive. And it hurt to get that feedback. It was embarrassing to me at the, in the moment to get that feedback. And even though I still thought that my example worked in, in my head, it still worked. I realized that if it didn't work for my audience, then I needed to change it. My goal at that point was not to be right It was to be effective. And those are two very different things. And that's where feedback can really come into play. If your mentor has not seen you in action, like leading a meeting, for example, or if you're going to a dance teacher to ask for feedback on a performance, you may have to think of some creative ways to help them see you in action. Uh, It's rare for a mentor or coach to be able to come watch you in action, uh, unless maybe it's your dance teacher or somebody in your local dance community who can actually come see you in person perform or somebody that you work with who has the time to come watch you present to a group. It is common practice for you to bring a video both in the dance world and in the corporate world. If somebody is coming to me looking for help with their presentation skills, this is going to be one of the things I ask them to do is record yourself doing a presentation either in front of an audience or not, but give me an example of what you're doing so that I can give you some constructive feedback. The same works in the dance world. Make sure that if you're planning to do this, that you are giving your example far enough in advance that your mentor or coach has enough time to actually go through it and view it and give thoughtful feedback. Now, if you feel that you are going to be particularly sensitive to getting feedback, I'm going to go ahead and just um, let you know that that is, it's actually very common to be sensitive to feedback. A lot of us have been in situations in our lives or in relationships with people who gave very critical feedback and often unsolicited critical feedback that has caused us to even hear the term feedback and immediately sort of bristle up with nervousness or with defensiveness. If you feel that getting feedback is going to be exceptionally difficult for you, and you're not feeling really comfortable asking for feedback yet, here's a recommendation. 
that can actually be part of your mentoring and coaching relationship. You can bring that as a goal to your conversations that you want to build your skill set in accepting feedback because it is a skill set to accept feedback. It takes conscious practice, awareness of yourself, and control of your reactions to be able to accept feedback in a positive and in, in a growth mindset. So if you think that getting feedback from a coach or mentor has actually maybe held you back from even going to get a mentor or even scheduling some private coaching lessons because you're terrified of getting feedback, have that conversation with your mentor or coach. Now, I will admit that I actually did this with my dance teacher. Uh, When I first had to perform for her, and do you hear that? I even said had to. The first time I got to perform for her and I was demonstrating some choreography, I think it was choreography that I had been working on and I wanted to get her feedback on it. I told her that I felt absolutely sick to my stomach. What is, I mean, this isn't, it's not funny, but it's, it is kind of funny that I have actually since had students as a, because I teach dance as well. And in my professional work and doing training and development work, I've actually had people tell me this too. It was scarier for me to perform for my dance teacher by herself than it was to perform in front of an audience of 500 people. It was scarier for me to get feedback from that group of peers in that training presentation session that I was telling you about than it was to literally do presentations at national conferences where I was speaking in front of 500 people in an auditorium. There is something about the intimacy of a coaching and mentoring relationship when you have that feeling of wanting to do a good job for somebody, you want to impress them, you want to make a a big impact, you don't want to disappoint them. That can layer on so many levels of fear in these types of private learning opportunities. And so I reached out to my teacher when I was getting ready to perform for her. And I was, I told her that I felt sick to my stomach. I was so nervous. And she, she kind of, you know, smiled and she said, I really don't understand because you dance in front of me multiple times a week. Like I see you dancing in class all the time. And I understand that this is different. This is a different setting, but I'm here to help you. I'm not here to break you down. I'm here to build you up. I'm here to make your goals come true for yourself. And she and I have since had this conversation with other students who have felt the same way. And so this is not an uncommon feeling. If you are feeling this level of fear about reaching out, about asking for help and guidance, about getting feedback from someone, Know that when you come in with a clear goal of what you want to move forward toward, your goal should become your mentor or coach's goal. They're trying to get you to the same place that you're trying to get to. If they have any kind of emotional intelligence at all, they will be cautious and careful about how they are giving that feedback so that it is something that you can act upon and that it's constructive. If you have interactions with someone that have not been positive and you have considered whether or not you want to have that person mentor or coach you, you might want to pay attention to any red flags that have been popping up previously in your interactions with that person. If they have been uh, harsh in the way that they speak with people, if you've seen that in other interactions that they've had with either yourself or with others, Tread very carefully. You may decide that you want to approach a different coach or mentor instead. Now, I'm not advocating here that you only find someone who's going to tell you that you're awesome and you don't need to change anything. That is not helpful. That is not productive. And that is unfortunately something that will hold you back in the long term because you're not going to be getting any better because you don't see those blind spots. You don't see those areas of improvement. But what I'm saying here is that you need to have trust with your mentor or with your coach. There has to be trust there 
for the relationship to be successful. So look for those relationships where you feel that you can trust the person, you feel that they trust you, you feel that they are going to have your goals in mind throughout those sessions of working with each other. If the relationship isn't working, then it's okay to step away from it. In fact, there will come a time when your coaching or mentoring relationship will end. And this is, I'm particularly talking about longer term sorts of setups. This is normal. It is not to be ignored or postponed. Don't just ghost your mentor or your coach by just not responding to them when they reach out to you to get a session scheduled. When your goals have been met, free that person up to help someone else. Thank them, share what you've gotten out of the relationship with them. You may even consider a thank you gift for their time. Keep in touch with them, even though your relationship has shifted. You can schedule a coffee meeting every once in a while, once a quarter, you know, send them an email or something at least every once in a while to let them know how things are going. This lets the mentor or coach know that you weren't just soaking up as much as you could and you're just throwing them aside. They have invested in you, and it's nice for them to see the benefits of the work that they have done. So let's say that after this whole conversation, you are interested in finding a mentor or coach. Your ideal person may be somebody you already know. It may be somebody in your current workplace. It may be your current dance teacher. It may be someone that is in your larger work or dance community that you want to work with. If you aren't quite finding who you're looking for, your connection may be one connection away from you. So think about reaching out and broadening your network a little bit. You can ask other people for recommendations if they've worked with another mentor or coach or dance teacher that you might want to also learn some things from. Reach out to the person and ask if they would be interested and available to work with you. Explain what you want to learn and why that person is your preferred choice. You can, if you feel comfortable, go ahead and share your expectations for how often you would like to meet. That helps to set a little bit of realism. A lot of times people, particularly in a free mentoring kind of relationship, will want a lot of time from their mentor and their mentor may not be able to give them that time. So let them know up front what your time commitment looks like and what you're wanting to get from them so that they can really start to plan and say, you know, am I going to have time? Am I going to have the energy to give this person the attention that they need? Set up calendar invitations well in advance. You can expect that around holidays, things are going to get rescheduled. So scheduling in advance instead of just one-off kind of scheduling can really help to solidify and help hold you accountable to your goals. Now for coaching, either in the dance world or outside of the dance world, expect to pay. It's a time commitment for the coach or mentor, especially if they're self-employed. And getting feedback and guidance from a very well-known dancer is definitely going to cost you. However, The investment to get feedback for yourself can definitely be worth it. It's basically the difference between rambling and stumbling around lost in a forest trying to find your own way out versus having an experienced guide to show you the way and turn you around when you head the wrong direction. All right, so let's take this one for a final spin. If you're interested in possibly being mentored or coached, start building your network Now, it makes it way easier to find someone to work with when you have a connection with them already. This applies to the non-dance world and the dance world. So if there is, for example, a dancer that you want to potentially study with or pay for private lessons, reach out and connect with that person on social media. See what opportunities to learn that they already have. Maybe they offer online classes where you can start to get to know that person before you get into that one-on-one type of environment. It gives you guys an opportunity to sort of feel each other out and to start building that trust level. Identify the one skill set or potentially the, the new role or career you want to learn more about 
and what your goal for the mentoring or coaching relationship would be. What is that one skill set or that one piece of feedback or that one focus area you want to work on? List out five questions you would ask your mentor or coach so that you have those ready. And then find a person to ask if you feel ready to take the leap. If you don't know anyone, ask someone who could refer you to someone else. So there you go, a quick look at how to really make the most out of private mentoring or private coaching sessions. If you have any other tips or tricks that you would like to share with the rest of our dance community, please email me and let me know and I will share those out. You can email me at bellydancealchemypodcast at gmail.com. Talk to you all soon. Bye-bye. Well, thanks for listening. If you like what you hear, please subscribe to this podcast and share the magic with your dance friends. If you want more, you can sign up for our mailing list at bellydancealchemy.org or you can email me your suggestions and feedback. I would love to hear from you at bellydancealchemypodcast at gmail.com. Bye. Thank you.